Hey Jody here with WeldingTipsAndTricks.com. This video is on stick welding, geared primarily to welding students. It's about the 2G horizontal plate test, 3 8 inch thick, quarter inch backing strap with a quarter inch gap. Today we're strictly doing the horizontal. I'm working on the vertical and overhead. We'll have those up pretty soon. I'll try to put those in the same video. We'll see what happens there. But anyway, I uh, hope this helps somebody. Uh, if you're in welding school, you're eager to get past this one test so you can get on to the other things so you can get down to the place where you can get out there and get a job and this is this is just one building block along the way so let's do it not too long ago I posted this video on padding beads in the horizontal position and you really need to do that before trying to take a 2G test it's just really good practice and gets your motor skills kind of ingrained and makes it where it's second nature feeding that rod in and using the right rod angles and all that stuff. So if you haven't watched that yet, I'll post a link to that video right here. But it is really good practice and it is the exact same skills, just stacking one bead halfway over the previous bead and that's really what it's involved in the 2G test. Alright, well on with the test now. Alright, got it set up here in this stand from Triangle Engineering. Get ready to start off, but let's take a look at the fit up now on this thing. I used a piece of quarter inch bar stock to get the gap in here, and you can see it fits in there with just a little extra space. I would rather have just a little over a quarter inch than a little under. Got to have enough room to get that 1 8 rod in there. Now some jobs might give you the choice of using 3 32nd or 1 8 I would prefer 1 8 just for the sake of having less tie-ins and being able to run more amperage. I'm attaching the ground clamp directly to the plate. That generally is a good practice. I recommend it anyway. And main, the main thing is not only getting a good ground, but also just preventing magnetic arc blow that you might get if you've got the ground uh, somewhere else. And also, if you get magnetic, if you get arc blow to where the rod is fingernailing toward one side or the other of the bevel, then move your ground clamp to the other side of the plate and do some stuff like that. It usually will help. This is about 135 amps. And to be honest, I would run just as hot as you can stand to run on the root pass. Maybe even 140 to 145 amps. The reason I say that is because I cut, polished, and etched after I finished these plates. I did two or three of them. And uh, they didn't penetrate as much as I thought into that backing strap. It's kind of deceiving. A 7018 is not a very high penetrating rod. So you really got to use some heat on that first pass to make sure that you consume those tips of the bevels as well as bite into that backing strap so that when it's all ground off you've got a good bend strap there. Now I would recommend not making a tie-in but stopping there and welding toward the middle. Stopping somewhere in the middle and then changing directions and welding toward that. Reason is that stopping and starting is a lot more likely to have a defect such as slag, lack of fusion, or porosity than once you've got the rod all going nice and hot like this and tying into a place where you stopped. And I'll show you that in just a second. Again, we're about 135 amps with a 1 8 7018 Lincoln Excalibur rod. And I'm tying in to where that crater of the previous run and then I'll fill that crater in here briefly like that and then come out and that's what that looks like. Now I'll show you how bend straps are laid out. This is close. This is I don't have the dimensions up there now but the bend straps typically come out somewhere in this region not out of the middle. So any tie-in you want to have any stop and start should be in the middle area. Probably a little off center actually would be best just in case they cut two straps right out of dead center. Now what I'm doing here is I'm coming over that root pass with one single pass using just a little bit of oscillation. You may have a test requirement, a test supervisor that has a strict limit on bead width, but if they'll let me do this, I will do this because it's, it's tough trying to stack two beads over top of that root pass without uh, cramming yourself on that top one and, and getting lack of fusion. I'd rather put one bead in there and being able to run it nice and hot. Again, I'm still at 135 amps then put two beads over top of that one when I have a little bit more room in the bevel to stack two beads. Alright, so putting that first one of two in here, the most important thing in my opinion is leave yourself enough room to get that second bead in there. So the second, if you've got two beads, three beads, four beads, that second to the last bead 
before you put that last one in a bevel, you really need to plan ahead and make sure to leave yourself enough room. If you don't leave yourself enough room and they'll let you grind a little bit, you need to kind of groove it out a little bit with a grinder. Make sure to give yourself enough room to get that rod in there and penetrate. If you've got a tight, tight crease, it's tough to make it penetrate. That's where we stand now, and I'll put the second one in there. Now, I ran two or three of these plates. That often is the case. I have to use one to try to get some decent up-close shots like this. So I'm going in a different direction on this pass than I showed just a second ago. But same thing applies. I'm trying just to keep a good, fairly tight arc length. Go along nice and slow. Watch the front of the puddle, making sure it looks like it is penetrating in. And uh, try not to leave any undercut. And so I'm in pretty good shape to run the, the last layer now. Just a little below flush toward the top and uh, not in bad shape at all. Now I didn't get shots. I forgot to turn the camera on or something to get arc shots of this first bead here. But you can just refer to that padding beads uh, video uh, and you can see exactly what that is. Because now at this point it's just like padding beads on a flat plate pretty much except for that last bead of trying to keep it straight and uh, you know not get undercut and everything. So I'm not in too bad a shape there. I intended to run that one kind of slow to give myself a little platform to stack the second bead on. And this one I kind of messed up. So I'm going to show you what I'm talking about here. I didn't overlap it enough. And that leaves for a little valley and that's not really what you want. I should have come down another at least another sixteenth of an inch lower. I should have placed that bead a sixteenth of an inch lower and that would have prevented that valley and would have made the whole thing look better. Now is the last bead. I'm pointing the electrode up just a little bit. Really watching the top edge of that bead to make sure that I don't get any undercut. And then I'm also watching the bottom of the bead trying to line up halfway over the previous bead. Not do it, really doing any oscillation or manip manipulation of the electrode here, just kind of running it nice and steady. But I wound up running it a little slower than I should have, and it, and it sagged a little bit. Either that or I got in a hurry, didn't let the plate cool enough, or I, maybe I could have turned down the amperage 5 amps or whatever, but here's what I'm talking about. I went a little bit slow on the last one and it, and it kind of sagged just a little bit. That in combination with not stacking the second one like it should have been. And it's a little bit, I got a little bit of valleys. This one came out a lot better. I decided just to run the same direction from right to left on this one and uh, probably let it cool a little bit more between passes. But anyway, now I'm gonna, we're going to do a little cutting, polishing, and etching. This is a good little educational exercise to uh, to see what happened, see what actually went on while it's still fresh in your mind. Now, I'm using a plasma cutter to cut mine here. It actually probably does a little bit better with an oxyacetylene torch. Loctite Naval Jelly Rust Dissolver works as a good etchant for distinguishing the weld nugget from base metal without being too hazardous and also it's readily available at Ace Hardware's and Lowe's and Home Depot and things like that. But with a Q-tip on there, it really brings out, as you can tell, exactly how much it penetrated. And this one was done at 130 amps. Still didn't really, really punch in there all that deep. This was 110 amps. While the overall profile of the cap looks a little bit nicer, you see it just barely got into that backing strap there. That's a little, that's a little questionable, a little iffy. Put a little light on it, and it really, you know, brings it out if you play the light. And right in that little corner right there makes me wonder if that one punched in there enough. You've got to remember that that backing strap is going to be completely removed, and that root side ground flush. So if there's any void there, if you didn't quite consume that tip of the bevel, then it's going to open up on that root bend. Now, this one was done at 135 amps. A little bit better on the depth of penetration into that backing strap. Also used a little thicker backing strap on here because that's just all I had laying around. But you can see also I have a little problem up here on the bevel right there, a little cluster of porosity. And I'm going to blame that on leaving the rods out overnight without having them in an oven. And uh, But that could happen easily on a stop and start, even if you've got fresh rods or rods that were in an oven.
So the little macro etch test here can tell you a lot. Very educational. You can see I thought I was doing pretty good on here, but realized I went outside the bevel too far, and then I've got a wonky bead profile on the cap with little valleys in there, and and uh, didn't penetrate as deep as I had hoped. So there's nothing like a cut, polish, and etch right after you weld something to kind of correlate what you saw going on as far as what actually went on. So short of doing a full-blown bend test, it's a good little educational exercise. I save this little commercial for the end here in case you want to bail on me now, but I have a new product on the Weldmonger store at weldmonger.com. It's a gas lens kit for number 9 and 20 style torches. Those are the small style TIG torches. I've been selling a stubby gas lens kit for large size torches like a 17, 18, and 26 for a while now, so now I've got, I've got both products. Well, we'll see you next week.